Everyone's going to sit out there. Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful day that the Lord has made. Not that rain can't also be beautiful, but I am pleasantly surprised by the sunshine, and it is so good to be here in worship with all of you as we uh, celebrate in this space. Also, for those who are worshiping online today, welcome. It is good to be with you too in, uh, in the spirit of God's love and grace. A few things are coming up today. First of all, the crop walk is happening today after worship. If you have signed up to walk, thank you so much for um, your dedication to ending hunger in this world and feeding our um, hungry siblings in Christ. If you didn't sign up to walk uh, but would still like to show up, you are still welcome to do so. So come and see me after worship and I'll make sure that you get directions to where you uh, need to be. And you can still donate to our team. So our goal this year was to raise $4,000 to help end hunger in um, this area and around the world. So um, you can use the QR code that you see on the screen here to donate, or again, if you want to donate in a different way, you're welcome to find me after worship, and I will help you to do that. Coming up in a couple of weeks is All Saints Sunday, and we are, as we usually have done, going to have a candle display and read the names of the saints who are particularly close to our hearts on that day. So if you would like to have us uh, light a candle in memory of someone, please get that person's name with the correct spelling uh, and probably the correct pronunciation to um, Sonia in the office here in the next uh, couple of weeks so that the saints that you know and love will be remembered on that Sunday. Also coming up right the Sunday before that, We are um, celebrating Reformation Sunday. We'll have a constitution, um, we'll have a special congregation meeting to review our constitution and to vote on amendments. So if you have any additional questions that haven't been answered in the last uh, couple of weeks, now's the time to get those answered so that on the 29th during our special congregation meeting, you are prepared to vote on those constitution and bylaw revisions. And then also on that day, we're doing a lot of things. So it's also the day of our All Saints Eve party, which will happen after worship. The Board of Youth is sponsoring a potluck meal, so be prepared to bring a side dish or a dessert to share during that congregation meeting. Then students ages 10 and under are welcome to go downstairs and participate in the All Saints Eve party. And then there's trunk or treat in our parking lot. So sign up for uh, that if you're um, interested and willing to have your car decorated and pass out candy. We will provide candy for you if you don't want to do that. And students will be able to walk around and see all of our uh, decorations and trick-or-treat at our trunks. So all of that is happening here in a couple of weeks. And again, if you need more information, just come and find me, and I am happy to share that with you. 
And now for today's mission moment, I'm going to invite Scott Uddenberg, our Director of Worship and Music, to come forward and share some notes about our worship practice here at Prince of Peace. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I was going to take a few minutes this morning to kind of talk a little bit about the worship service in and of itself. How does it come about? How is it that we put things together? And why is it that we do what we do in worship? And it's a very complicated answer and, quite frankly, something that I could take practically hours to kind of get into up here, which I won't do because my son in particular doesn't want me to be up here that long. But I wanted to list a few things that actually impact the choices that we make in worship. Uh, obviously, Pastor Aaron is the worship leader of this congregation, and so everything that we do in the way of planning goes through Pastor Aaron. But we sit down and we have a number of things that we talk about, and we have a lot of things that impact what those choices are. One of the most obvious things is what the season of the church year is. Obviously, we are in the season of Pentecost. Things around the church that recognize that is that the choir has their green stoles on, that we have the green things up all over the walls, and even green on the, on the, on the screens, all right? Because in some cases, the screens also recognize what the season of the church year is. Another piece of that kind of structure is also what we call the lectionary. The lectionary is the readings that get assigned for a particular Sunday. This Sunday, for example, is the 20th Sunday, um, or the uh, real-time 20th Sunday in Pentecost, all right? And so that particular day has readings that are assigned to it. So a lot of the hymns and things that we do, the what um, Pastor Aaron says in a sermon on a given morning, is very much reflective of what takes place in the lectionary. It makes and inf influences a lot of our choices. But that's not the only thing. For example, we have a theme that we've been working through, whether you may be aware of it or not, that is all based upon the God's work, our hands thing concept that we talked about right on Labor Day weekend that we talked about. And that has been working all the way through this season. All of our pieces of liturgy, prayers, and some of the responses we've been doing have all been based on a liturgy that was crafted in and around that concept, that idea. That works into the idea of creation. We tie that in also into the season of the year, which is autumn and fall, and the fact that it's harvest time, and that we very are connected with creation. So there's all kinds of elements about creation that you will have found in the worship service, both all through the last couple of months, leading in now all the way to Thanksgiving and to Advent, and also even this morning, okay? Um, the missionary, uh, the missions of the church, the ministries of the churches, Everything that we are doing, this church is doing, in the way of outreach and the things that we talk about in our announcements are all reflected in what we do in worship, whether it be a direct announcement saying, hey, we're doing trunk or treat, or for something else that we're doing in the way of first communion or confirmation. All these things can be reflected in worship. Um, current events has a very, very heavy impact on me, for example, and when I'm doing some planning. Pastor and I always are talking about what kinds of things are happening in the world. If there's been a natural disaster someplace, obviously the conflict now that's in the Middle East weighs heavily when, when we're planning worship. So a lot of choices can be made to be addressing those things, particularly in like the prayers of intercession or like we're going to be doing with the lament that we're doing this morning in worship. The sacraments are always a piece of worship. Coming to the communion table is something that we do every week to remind how it is that Jesus told his disciples what to do in order to spread the word. And we are reminded of that every week. And of course, we love when we have somebody come and get um, brought to the baptismal font. These are essential elements of the faith. And they're things that we need to be reminded of, not only for ourselves, but for everyone. And what we are in the way of evangelists of our particular way of thinking about um, our connection with Christ. And so these are always important in worship. There is the idea of technical issues, right? I mean, for example, if the power goes out, there's certain choices we can't make. If something happens where I don't have my trumpet player this morning, then maybe I'm not doing that song that I thought we were going to do. There's all kinds of other reasons why we might have to make particular choices, but usually that's a smaller impact on what you are seeing in worship on a Sunday morning. But you know, what I have found is that the most important piece of planning and putting the day of the worship service for our congregation is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always watching over and guiding what kinds of things that we're doing in order to say, what is the work of the people? What is the 
the people need in, in order for us to go out into the world and interact and be supported by our faith and our relationship with Christ. And it's amazing to me how the Spirit can be moved. An example of this just happened last Sunday as I was actually doing the psalm with you all on Sunday morning. It was a psalm that I had read earlier in the week, and quite frankly, Pastor Anair and I had conversations about sometimes, well, we can't always see what the relevancy of a particular um, lesson is on the world or on the week or whatever. Well, all of a sudden, the words of the psalm, as I was doing them with you last week, just suddenly talked to me in the way of what that, those issues in the Middle East were all about. And the lifting up of King David and the same kinds of grieving has got to be the same kinds of grieving that leadership is doing in Israel today. And it was amazing to me how what seemed to be a nebulous, almost, almost, you know, kind of common psalm was so particularly speaking to the moment that we were gathered in worship together. And I don't know if you all had that opportunity to feel that same kind of thing, but I know that that happens to me a lot, and I get shocked many times about how the Holy Spirit creates something in worship that our hands have something to do with that we don't even see what the true impact is until we do it together in worship. So I kind of look at the worship service a little bit as kind of like a game of bingo or a Where's Waldo. It's like every single piece of the worship service is probably something that has something that relates to something that's going on in all of these various elements. So one of the ways to continually make worship mean something more, a little more than just, hey, okay, that song was kind of really fun and it made me kind of feel good, is what is the connection of all of these pieces together? How does the one reading relate to, release to something else? What did Pastor Aaron lift up in her sermon based on, on this, the song that we do afterwards or whatever else? It's another way, it's another way to kind of lift up and create an opportunity for you to see how worship can connect to you. So, as always, if you have any kind of questions about anything about worship, you, first of all, you go to Pastor Aaron. But if Pastor Aaron has got something that's keeping her time, then you can come and talk to me, and if I don't know the answers, then I'll tell you to go talk to Pastor Aaron, all right? So, but just keep in mind is that when we're actually going through worship, everything in worship has a purpose and has a reason for being there, even if we don't necessarily know. So, be guided by the Spirit. Thank you. And now as the Spirit calls, gathers, and enlightens us as community, I invite you to take a posture of reverence as we continue our worship with confession and forgiveness. In the name of the triune God, who loves us into being, calls us to community, and inspires us to love, amen. Confronted by the law and called to life in the gospel, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. God of love and community, we confess that we have not loved as God has loved us. We look to ourselves to fulfill your law. We seek to satisfy our own desires. We turn away from our neighbors and live for ourselves alone. Teach us again your statutes and help us to love your will, that in and through us your beloved community is made known. Beloved of God, Love is the fulfillment of the law, and in Jesus, God's love for you is made known. Through Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and you are drawn into God's love and life. Live fully, knowing that God loves you. Amen. Now the feast and celebration all of creation sings for joy to the god of life and love and freedom praise and glory forevermore now is the feast of the lamb once slain whose blood has freed and united us to be one great people 
temple of God. Now the feast and celebration, all of creation sings for joy. To the God of life and love and freedom, praise and glory forever. and riches, wisdom and might, all honor and glory to Christ forever. Now the feast and celebration, all of creation sings for joy. To the God of life and love and freedom, praise and glory forever. God has come to dwell with us, to make us people of God, to make all things new. Now the feast and celebration, all of creation sings for joy. To the God of life and love and freedom, praise and glory forever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with King David of old, we cry out. Each day, we hurt one another. Each day, we diminish our very selves. Oh God, why are humans so prone to evil? My sin is my fault. My fault, my own most grievous fault. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. O God. Hear us, O God. Deliver us from our offenses. Deliver us from our offenses. Give us your life. Give us your life. Hear these words and receive their power. God the Father forgives even those sins of which we are unaware. God the Son accompanies us in a journey toward love and obedience. God the Spirit reconciles us to a family of forgiveness. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord of the feast, 
You have prepared a table before all peoples and poured out your life with abundance. Call us again to your banquet. Strengthen us by what is honorable, just, and pure, and transform us into a people of righteousness and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. The, the first reading is found in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you, for you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress, a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of aliens like heat in a dry place, you subdued the heat with the shade of clouds. The song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained and clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Word of God, word of life. Surely good 
goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You'll prepare a table before me. And my cup is running over. second reading is found in Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4. My siblings whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the way, in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge you, Rhodia, and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, Help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Word of God, word of life. be glad and rejoice in God's salvation. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Now a story according to the Holy Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look! I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready but those invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, 
but few are chosen. Holy wisdom, holy word, praise to you, O Christ. Let's catch up a little bit before we dive into this story that Jesus tells. Jesus tells this story right after the story that you may have heard in worship last week. He's talking to the chief priests and elders in Israel, those who are the religious ones. And last week he told them essentially that everybody else would be going into the kingdom of God before they would get there. So he tells this story just to back it up. We ended last week with the, with the chief priests and elders being ready to kill him because of what he said. So, I mean, clearly this story is going to make that better, right? <sighs> Jesus, last week in that story, as we unpacked it, we understood that if we are those who tend the garden, it is we who are called to expand the gates. We who are called to push the boundaries and invite people into the kingdom of God. We are called to go out and make sure that everyone knows the message of God's love. And so this week, as we dive into a story about a wedding feast, a story about a place where many are invited, it almost seems like Jesus is saying the exact opposite of the story we heard last week. This is not an uncommon thing, actually, for Jesus, and we as Lutherans fully delve into things that seem to be utterly contradictory. As Lutherans, we are absolutely 100% saints and absolutely 100% sinners. As Lutherans, we dive into the both and. Jesus is absolutely 100% present in the meal of communion and also if you put it under a microscope, it's still bread and wine. As Lutherans, we believe that this is the way that God works. There is not a this or that. There is a somehow all of this and that together. And that is the grace of God that exists in our lives and our world. This is a really tricky place for me to be as a Lutheran pastor and theologian at this time in the world. As we lift up and lament the war happening in Israel and Palestine. Because on the one hand, we as Lutherans provide support for the Augustana Hospital that is outside of Jerusalem near the Mount of Olives. We provide support for the churches, uh, the Christian churches in the Holy Land. We partner with them in not only their humanitarian efforts, but also in our theological understandings and beliefs. And these Christians are Palestinians. We absolutely stand with them against violence and atrocities committed against them. We absolutely believe that they deserve justice. At the same time, we as Lutherans are certain that God's promises are always God's promises and are absolutely sure. And so we as Lutherans believe that the Jewish people are God's people. We believe with the prophet Isaiah that this land, this place, will be that which God has called and chosen God's people to inhabit. And that at some time, God will provide justice and home for these Jewish people. And so as we look at this conflict, as we live in the midst of this world, as I talk to my good friends, both at Beth Tikva congregation and also those I know from seminary and my family who are Palestinian, all of them are living in heartbreak and fear. 
And we as Lutherans are living in this both and world where every single one of God's children is invited to a feast, where every single one of God's children deserves justice and peace and safety and life. And where no matter who it is or what it is, it is more complicated than many of us, maybe all of us, can understand. What is this feast to which we are invited? As Lutherans, again, we have a both and as God invites us into the sacraments. We in the Lutheran Church have two sacraments. We believe in the sacrament of baptism, which is the invitation and the washing away of sins for ourselves and also all the world. We believe that God is truly present there and we are invited into the Christian church and just because someone is not a part of the Christian church, just because they don't believe or worship with us doesn't mean that God's grace and invitation and forgiveness of sins doesn't extend to them. It extends to the whole world, to all of God's creation. The other sacrament that we as Lutherans understand and believe in is the sacrament of the table, of communion, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. This place where Christ is fully present, where we recognize that Christ died and was buried, where Christ descended into hell, and also that Christ raised from the dead is alive within us and beyond us and continuing to invite us to a feast, to a place where, again, all are welcome. This is where we are in this conflict between what is and what will be what has been and what is promised. The kingdom of God is yet at hand, not fully present, and also here at this table, fully present and realized among us with all the saints of every time and place. This is the feast to which we are invited. Enter now Jesus' story about a feast, a wedding feast, a both-and feast where all of those have been invited. Now those who have been invited are the wealthy, the ones who have businesses, the ones who own land. They are the ones who don't need to come to the feast except that this is a friend. This is a moment that we celebrate. And each and every one of them upon receiving the invitation, say, I don't have time for that. Now maybe the man throwing the feast forgot to send out save the dates. Maybe the man throwing the feast forgot to tell them that all of this was going to be happening. But whatever it is that happened, this one was so angry that motivated by violence, he went in and completely ran over those who he, whom he had previously called friends, those he lived with, those he did business with, those he relied on. With violence motivating his heart, he went in and killed them all. This is not the way that God invites us to this feast. Yes, this feast is a both and because each and every one of us has within us exactly that, that vengeance, that desire for violence. When we believe that we have been disrespected, when we know that someone doesn't care about the things that we care about, when we know that we disagree, we too can be motivated by the desire, the want, the need to show everybody 
that we have more power than they have, that they are wrong and have wronged us. Each of us can be in that place. And then this one who has already prepared a feast, he's got all this food, he's already killed the fatted calf, he's already put down the deposit and spent all the money. He says, go out and find people to eat this, everyone, both the good and the bad. So his servants go out and they invite everyone. They just walk down the street. They knock on doors and say, hey, come and eat. You are welcome. Come on and be here. I have to be honest with you. If I knew that this man had just run over all of the people he called friends. I'm not sure that I'd want to show up, no matter how hungry I was. But people show up. Here they come. Welcome, invited to this feast, this place where violence has been, but now an outpouring of love, of help, of joy, a wedding, that which marks the future and not only the past. Here, invited in this place, people are enjoying one another's company, but there is one. There's always one, right? There is one who walks in, and when the steward tries to hand him a robe of celebration, decides he's not going to wear it. Maybe he takes it from the steward and then rolls it up and puts it behind the curtain and goes and sits down. This robe is a mark of respect. A reminder that all are welcome here and all are celebrating. That a gift has been given by the host of this particular party, this particular feast. And so it's not particularly surprising, knowing the beginning of the story, that what happens when the giver of that feast, this wealthy man, comes in and sees the one who is disrespecting him, again he says, throw him out. Get him out of here. He's not worthy. Get rid of him. This, again, is representative of the ways that we can respond, that we can react. When we say, I have given you everything I possibly could give, I have given you food, I have given you clothes, I have welcomed you into my home, into my space, and here you are disrespecting me. So get out. I want nothing to do with you. Not a moment to say, why is this happening? Why did you decide not to wear the robe? Why did you come? Not a moment to listen. Not a moment to hear another perspective, but simply the violence that rises up within him and kicks him out. As Christians in our Christian tradition, we can run the risk of being exactly that person, exactly that community. We can run the risk of saying, on the one hand, all are welcome here, and on the other hand, when somebody shows up saying, but not you. All are welcome here, but only if you look like me, or only if you act like me, or only if you know how to behave. You are welcome here, but only if you don't scream during worship. You are welcome here, but only if you can sit still for an hour. We run the risk of saying, to God's people, you are welcome here only if. And God says again and again, all are welcome here. At this feast, this feast of God, it is both and. You are welcome as sinner, and you are welcome as saint. You are welcome when you are hungry, and you are welcome when you are confused. You are welcome when you are joy-filled, and you are welcome when you are heartbroken. 
And may the feast that we share transform all of us so that the violence in our hearts might turn into desire for peace, for love, for justice, and for grace. This story also reminds us, though, that although all are welcome here, there are ways that we do need to be with each other. If we come and we disrespect one another, one another's beliefs, one another's understandings, one another's lives, one another's families, then we are not truly making a welcome space. As people come, we hand out wedding garments of love and grace and hope and expect that one another will put those on, put on that which is Christ's, that which we receive in our baptism, so that as we listen and as we care for one another, we can know that each person is not only welcome at this feast, but safe here as who God has created you to be. And so this is the feast to which we are invited time and time and time again as fully sinner and as fully saint. And so may we clothe ourselves with, our baptis with the baptismal grace that God has given us. And may we be transformed so that that which is, that which is within us that would hurt one another may become instead a desire for peace and a hope for love in all the world. That is this feast to which we come. Amen. Let us go now to the banquet, to the feast of the universe. The table set and a place is waiting. Come everyone with your gifts to share. I will rise in the early morning. The community's waiting for me. With a spring in my step, I'm and my family let us go now to the banquet to the feast of the universe the table set and a place is waiting come everyone with your gifts to share poor and hungry to the banquet of justice and good where the harvest will not be hoarded, so that no one will lack for food. Let us go now to the banquet, to the feast of the universe. The table set and a place is waiting. Come everyone with your gifts to share. May we build such a place of has called us to work together and to share everything we have. Let us go now to the banquet, to the peace of the universe. The table set and a place is waiting. Go 
welcome everyone with your gifts to share. Let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in the transformative power of God's loving spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. For the church of Jesus Christ in this and every land, that all followers of Christ share the mind of Christ and strive to live together in peace, staying firm in the Lord. God, we pray. Open. For green pastures and still waters and all the beauty of the natural world, that creation flourishes and humankind lives in right relationship with all you have made, God, we pray. For the nations of the world and all who hold positions of authority, that they govern in accordance with God's vision of justice, providing shelter and refuge to all in need, striving toward the goal of peace and prosperity for all. God, we pray. For all experiencing valleys of illness and grief, that they may be healed and comforted and find rest in the presence of the Good Shepherd who walks beside them. We pray especially for those whom we now name audibly or silently. God, we pray, open our hands in love. For this community of believers, that wherever there is conflict or discord, the love of Christ may keep us united and make us mindful of all that is true, honorable, just, pure, pleasing, commendable, and excellent. God, we pray. With the psalmist we cry, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For the sake of our relatives and friends, I will say, peace be within you. For peace in Palestine and Israel, Ukraine, Russia, Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Myanmar, in all places experiencing armed conflict and violence. God, we pray. For the young adults participating in this year's ELCA Young Adults in Global Mission program, and especially for Jenny Uddenberg, that they may be strengthened for their year-long journey of service and witness and experience your transforming power in their lives. God, we pray. In thanksgiving for the beloved saints who now rest in your mercy, especially Teresa of Avila, teacher, renewer of the church, that their faithful witness guides your church until the day we join them at your heavenly feast. God, we pray. 
Gracious God, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your unending love and amazing grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to share God's peace with one another.
the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and the dreams of all, unite them with the prayers we offer. A foretaste of the feast to come. Holy God, giver of all good things, receive the gifts we bring, fruit of the earth and the work of human hands, that they may be used to your purposes for life and love in the world. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We Praise, glory, and thanksgiving to you, God, our loving creator. In the beginning, you reached your hands into the earth and formed humanity in your own image. You breathed into us your own breath of love and gave us hearts and hands and voices to live your loving purpose in the world. Seeing the lonely creature of earth, you created a partner that we would know the joy of community. Throughout the history of your people, you never abandoned us, but brought us into community with one another and with you, and guided us through the prophets. With endless patience and love, you called to us time and again to return to life with you. In the fulfillment of all things, you came to us in Jesus, born into a human family, raised in a hometown, who gathered around himself a community formed by your love, and yearned to gather all people under the loving wings of a mother hen sitting at dinner with friends and knowing one among them would break the bonds of love. Our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, 
broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And then again after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Trusting in his promise to be among us whenever we gather in his name, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gathered as your people, meeting in Jesus' name and preparing ourselves to feast upon Jesus' very body and blood, we plead with all creation, come, Lord Jesus. Send your spirit upon this meal, the body and blood of Jesus, that we overflow with your selfless love. Turn us to face our neighbors, that by us and through us, your love may be made known in the world. Again, we beg, come, Holy Spirit. All honor and praise and glory to you, God of creative dirty hands, God of holy wounded hands, God who strengthens and guides our hands now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come now to this banquet, for all is now ready. I invite you to be seated and come forward at the direction of the ushers. As a reminder, after you receive the elements, you may return to your seat or come forward to stand or kneel at the altar rail. And those who are worshiping from home today know that this is the body and blood of Christ given and shed for you. felt 
confession, mercy, truth bravely said, mercy, willing surrender, mercy for all, through wine and bread, mercy I invite you to take a posture of reverence as you receive this blessing. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen, keep, and unite us in God's grace on this day and forever. Amen. Holy Jesus, in this meal you have fed and nourished us to work in your beloved world. Send us now, filled with yourself, and strengthened by your spirit to live your love for others. Amen. Receive this blessing. God who sets forth the law of love, Jesus who fulfills the law for you and the spirit whom you are called to love, bless you this day that you may be God's hands and heart and voice at work in the world. Amen. Go in peace. God is at work in you. Thanks be to God. to all who 